Hey guys, welcome to the first video on what'll be my second channel. Today we're going to take a fairly in-depth review on a particular firearm. And we're going to compare what is actually a great carry gun with a gun that was made for women. And as part of this, we're also going to be discussing one of the most terrible advertising campaigns I've ever seen. So let's get into it. To start with, we're going to kind of go into the history of this gun, the Walther PDP, the F-Series. We're going to compare it to the other firearms in Walther's line and, and kind of see how it's evolved into this, the latest model. Uh, we're going to have some shooting, we've got some target footage, and again, just the overall impressions after carrying this thing full-time for a few months now. So the Walther PDP F is the latest in a fairly long line of Walther's 9mm semi-automatic sidearms. And if we're going to look at this gun and see what's new and different about it um, and what makes it interesting, we kind of have to look at the progression of stuff that led up to it. So the question is where to start? Well, I don't think we have to start all the way back here, right? Um, with one of Walther's first commercial uh, successes. I think there's a much more clear starting point in the lineage to this particular firearm. And that would be right here. And of course, most of you guys are be familiar with this. This is the P38, uh, the German Second World War service pistol, double single action. Wasn't the first of its kind, but it was just a really solid implementation of a locked breech service pistol. It used the, the weird tilting flapper lock, which I'm not going to sit here and tell you was the best design for a locking system, but it was good enough to really set off the entire Wonder 9 generation of handguns that we're still operating in today. And uh, anyone who can test that, it's pretty clear Beretta is still using a direct copy of this locking system today. But of course, with the P38, which later transformed into the P1, which is the same thing, just with an aluminum frame and a slightly reinforced slide. The, the main issue here was this old world design where you have a lot of, you know, just stuff sticking off of your gun. There's a lot of stuff that gets snagged. And while it looks mega cool, uh, Everyone knows, right, as, as time went on, the only way your gun looked cool with stuff hanging off of it is if you attached it to a pick rail. So after that progression of the P1, P4, we got the P5. And the P5 is really, in my opinion, the first of Walther's modern 9mm service pistols. Of course, on the inside, this still has the locking system of the P38, an incredibly robust gun. It's got the aluminum frame of the P1 with the reinforce on the frame, uh, but they eliminated all of those dangly bits, right? The giblets are gone. This is a much sleeker profile uh, designed to be able to be drawn from a holster without catching onto things, still maintaining double single action, but now integrated controls. So the only controls that you have to operate are this lever and the mag release. And interestingly, this lever does both release the slide and decock the firearm. Pretty slick. And the thing I want you to notice here is that this was a service weapon with an over travel stop. That's kind of uh, another thing that has always drawn me to Walther's is their attention to detail when it comes to triggers. These have a incredible trigger, a great crisp, clean break with a very short reset. And, and that's something that will permeate throughout the line as we go on. Still, there was a big drawback to the P5. It saw some adoption, but by this time, we were really moving on to double stack. And this is still a single stack firearm with an eight round magazine. Of course, the high power had been in the market for quite a long time and that was really taking hold. So, while they had to advance and, and you know get on with things. And that led to probably the most unappreciated part of the story, the P88. Again, we maintain a double single design with a very common aesthetic. It's not the coolest looking firearm, but if you'll notice, we've still got a double single trigger with an over travel stop. Again, these have incredible triggers for a service pistol. Same basic idea, double single with a decocker, right? Really good, robust, stout action. And now with 15 round mags as standard. So when we moved into the striker era, because people, 
gained a fear of hammers. I, you know, there, there was a, a bunch of different reasons why. Walther didn't want to abandon the training um, and muscle memory and, and just kind of habits that you could get into by having a double single, which was really attractive to me because I'm somebody with a handgun had always had a, a double single hammer fired handgun. And that's when we get to the first in what is really a direct lineage here between these guns and the star of the show today. And that is the P99. Of course, the name P99, a lot of people wonder where it comes from. It's actually the amount of people that Carl Walther had personally executed with the prototypes. So the P99 is a fascinating gun, and I think it's still underappreciated to this day. It's it's fairly early in the polymer striker fired era, right? But it has it maintains a double single trigger. And you have a superior mag release that doesn't require you to move your hand on the grip. This mag release will become a bit of a theme later on. Um, regardless, the P99 has a striker status indicator on the back. Moving the, the slide just about a half an inch completely recocks the striker. It has an incredibly short, incredibly crisp trigger. We have a fairly long take up and then a very clear stop and it breaks like glass. The big thing here though, your follow-up shots have almost no reset. It's like a computer mouse. It's, the double action is nothing to write home about. It's, it's fairly long and gritty because you are fully cocking a striker. Many people had a hard time understanding the P99 uh, because many, <laughs> Americans who say they're gun people uh, tend to pull their triggers like this, right? And if you are a trigger slapper, the quarter inch approximately of take up on the P99 is going to be a problem for you. The other thing that is really seminal about this design is that the striker is fully cocked. And that is why you are able to have such a tight and light trigger pull. Unlike on one of these firearms, designed for the fairer sex where you are actually doing the work of the striker with your trigger pull and you feel that grittiness and kind of a smushy break where you're pulling that striker the last 30 percent of the way the p99 and its progeny only need you to just drop the steer down from the striker remember that issue with the full cock striker as we go on the other, in my opinion, major issue with the P99, and the P99 maintains uh, as my favorite service weapon to this day. However, it was very early in the polymer revolution, and look at this grip texture, or lack thereof. If you don't put, like, talon grips or something on this thing, as you get sweaty and you're shooting, it is going to want to get out of your hand. Those little tiny dimples that are few and far between do little to nothing to keep the gun in your hand, especially when you are mag dumping into trash, as we are wont to do. So that leads us to the next generation, the PPQ. Now, the PPQ is a fascinating generation. We got this incredible grip texture. We got this very long, flappy mag release, which is just a pleasure to use. It was actually on the much later P99s that the mag release got so long like this. So great texture, a lot of great stuff going on, but it is now single action only. And this is because by this time, Glocks had taken such a hold, I guess the idea was let's just make it more like a Glock. And so it is single action only, but it maintains that full cock striker. Super crisp, super clean, a fantastic trigger pull, as is the case with almost all of these guns. But I, I feel like a, lost was, a lot was lost here. This era also saw a lot of change happening with the company and the products they were coming out with. There was some really interesting stuff. What I'm looking at here is a mark for the a, a passive RFID transponder which can be integrated into the backstrap of the pistol. It apparently records weapon-specific data. 
that could be read via some sort of external unit. Not 100% sure what the use case is for that. Um, of course, <laughs> these ones you know, cannot be remotely deactivated or, or however you have it. But we also, and this was a, a great loss in my opinion, saw the end of Walther's employ of the Flappy Paddle mag release. Now, the Flappy Paddle mag release is objectively superior. Anyone who suggests otherwise is suffering from some kind of severe trauma. But, again, as we said, later on in the PPQ's life, there was the release of the PPQ M2, which had a more 1911 style, right, button thumb mag release. And very quickly, the Flappy Paddle was phased out entirely in favor of the button. We also saw a lot of interesting models come out of the PBQ. This is the Q5 match, the original Q5 match, which again has the button mag release. You could get the Q5 match with the flappy paddle, but this is an example of the, you know, M2 style, which would again go on to this day in, in Walther sidearms. And also, so we saw Walther really stepping into the high-end market with the steel frame series. And regrettably, you could not get the steel frame with a flappy paddle. By that point, it was button only. But this is fairly similar to the PPQ mechanically, but with a solid steel milled frame. Honestly, one of the coolest guns that I've ever had any experience with. But that's kind of the PPQ lineage. One thing that's really interesting here, though, with the PPQ lineage, right? Or I guess I should say the P99 lineage, is the locking geometry on these firearms stayed the same. What that means is... These firearms internally are so similar, and they share a virtually identical identical locking block that get mine this is the P99 frame you can hot swap slides and some people will actually do this where they will take a P99 trigger group and put it into a um, PPQ frame uh, with a P99 striker so that they can have that double single. But by just hot swapping them, you're going to wind up with, you know, effectively a, a single action only gun. But that's important that the locking geometry has not changed. These guns are mechanically very similar. We have just lost... We've just lost the double single functionality. So that leads us up now to the PDP. This is a standard full size PDP and by God, is it the ugliest gun in the P99 legacy? Uh, let's not, mince words here. It looks like shit. They were really going really hard for the try hard market, right? With these serrations at the front that are an inch deep that you could like, I think you could use this, you'd grate cheese on these or like cut julienne fries. Uh, it's really preposterous, but really effective. It did unfortunately give the slide an unbelievably square profile. The thing looks stupid looking down the sights of it. As you can see. However, we got probably one of the best grip textures stock on a striker fired handgun. We got an incredible single action trigger now. Again, we mourn the loss of the flappy paddle, but that is so crisp and so clean. It's incredible. We're going to compare all the triggers with a gauge in just a bit, but we're just kind of talking broad strokes right now. 
So a lot of you guys probably remember the PDP. Walther did a huge marketing push. They, they paid every gun tuber that had ever fired a shot to say nice things about this handgun. And I don't know how well it did, but I certainly have, have bought them. They're certainly a great gun. Uh, despite how hideous they are, they're probably the best performing and feeling right out of the box service pistol um, out right now, in my opinion. Of course, this one came with night sights, the whole nine yards. All of them are optics cut. It's really a Walther for the 21st century. And again, you might think that after all this time, they might have changed some of the locking geometry. But... They did not. So how is the trigger that much better and that much different than this thing? Well, you can see it when you look into the frames. They have changed the design of the trigger box somewhat. I mean, it's still the same basic design, but we've got a different type of spring and just a retuned and rebalanced um, sear setup. Much stronger ejector. There's just been a lot of thought put in to the PDP's trigger mechanism. So that's the regular PDP. Then we're going to talk about the star of today's show. This gun is probably one of the most poorly marketed products I have ever seen. It's the PDP F which stands for female. And when I first saw this out there, I was just like, Walter, what is you doing? It, it, there, there was nothing like mechanically different about it, uh, significantly anyway, unlike the Shield Easy series and, and stuff like that with the ridiculously easy caulking. They are fairly easy to caulk, but the regular PDP is as well. And so I ordered one the moment I could, the, the, and they didn't send me this. Um, I got this the moment I, I saw it at, at a distributor I was able to order from. And I got it in, took it out, held it in my hand, and I do not have small hands. As a point of comparison, here's a standard size Corgi. Okay. You can see these are large at, at best meat hooks. I picked this thing up and I was just like, oh my God. That just feels incredible. And it's exquisitely slim. At this point, I was carrying a 43X and I held this thing in my hand. I noticed it held 15 rounds. And I was, <laughs> I was like, I found my new carry gun. I handed it around to all of my friends who were again, mostly bigger guys over six feet. And each of them were like, that fits amazing. So the real thing Walther did with this F series is just took all of the juiciness they could out of the grip they just completely reprofiled it to make it svelte cute charming the profile is just so thin and you get it uses a regular pdp magazine it's only slightly thicker than the 43x so i immediately knew this was going to be a solid carry gun so what's different on the PDPF? Well, for the first time in this series we're talking about here, we have a different locking block. The block locking block has the rails built in, uh, similarly to what the old P99 compacts had. But, is no longer compatible. They have changed a little bit of geometry, and now it's stuck. <laughs> they have changed just a little bit of geometry on the inside here to where it is no longer cross compatible. There's this new ridge here inside the slide, different locking block, very similar geometry, but 
this is effectively a new design. The loss of compatibility, you know, may be a drawback to some, but given the fact that most people aren't even aware of that degree of cross compatibility, it probably doesn't matter. But we keep that incredible clean trigger. It's really, really solid. So let's talk about actually carrying this thing. Like I said, when I got this gun, it was. <laughs> I was not intending to actually carrying it. I, I got it as sort of a funny joke. The marketing on this gun was so aggressively... Well, let's show you a little bit of it. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't great. I feel like Walther kind of might have shot themselves in the foot a little bit, as we'll talk about a little later. But I had to find a way I was going to carry this thing. And so I talked to my buddy Isaac at T-Rex Arms and he gave me special, look with the right color and everything, a holster for this guy. For one, I'll just say that I love this holster. This is the sidecar something or other um, from T-Rex Arms. And you get to hold your gun and a spare mag and it will bend to fit and conform to that girlish figure of yours. And given the makeup of my audience, I would be horrified to know what the degree is of this bend. Probably like this. But regardless, with the spare mag, I carry appendix it almost completely disappears into my waistline and not just because I've been gaining weight. It is actually just incredibly svelte. You get to have it right at the correct height. So you can grab just above your uh, belt line, rip it out, spare mag on tap. That's 30 round package right here in a completely concealed state. I, I know there's others on the market that can give you that and can give it to you even smaller, but not with this trigger pull and this level of performance. This gun really does perform like a full-size handgun, which we'll be showing you as we went to the range. And this, that was one of the first times I had fired the guns. I have since carried it for months. This thing prints really well. All right, my offhand group at 25 yards, um, which is you know, more a function of me than anything else, but was great for a handgun of this size, about five inches, and just firing, standing, unsupported, offhand. The mechanical accuracy is probably three or four MOA, uh, as is common with, you know, tilting barrel locked breech pistols. So it's not going to be anything to write home about, but then again, nothing these days is. One issue I have had is with regard to the spare magazine. You know, the the thing with the magazine I've had might be more to do with me being somebody who carries appendix and sweats like Cody Wilson in a school zone, but I will point out that these are plain steel magazines, which is the case for most Metcar mags. These are Italian mags, 
Same stuff you get in a Beretta. Same stuff you get with a whole host of OEMs. But this is the mag I keep in that spare slot, and it did start to show a little bit of surface rust right here. So if you're somebody who's used to glocazines, which are way fatter, but you never have to deal with the fact that they're made of metal, that is a thing that happened here, but is it going to affect the functionality? No. Uh, I'm just wanting to report you know, everything I experienced. So I did get a little bit of surface rust there after a couple of months of carrying. That's concerning for me. Uh, I feel like maybe they'll want to look into a better coating on the mag. It's not concerning it from a functionality standpoint. It's just that I was just a little surprised that after not having pulled it out and, and put it back in that much that we'd get that degree of bubbling on the magazine. The magazine that I carry in the gun, no such, no such issues, no rust, no nothing, and no, no such issues anywhere else on the firearm either. But again, and you'll see me drawing from this holster in the video, it has just become my favorite package. As you can see here, I'm just a regular dude. I'm not carrying 30 rounds of Walther. Nope. Not on me. No, sir. Whoops! Boof, 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 boof! So let's get into a little comparison because that's, you know, spice of life or something. This is, of course, your standard Glock 19, which can be found in the glove box of many Miatas and other cars of similar ilk across the nation. And then we have, of course, the PDPF. They're both compact. They both carry 15 rounds. One of them was designed specifically for women, and one of them has the most intolerable fan base in the world. Which could be either one, according to your perspective. Of course, looking at the grip profile, see, the PDP is a little more svelte. It's a little thinner. And that really counts when you are attempting to conceal a weapon. Of course, this is a Gen 5. It has the magazine flare. You don't have that on the PDP. That could be seen as a point against the PDP, but in my opinion, there's much more of a taper on the PDP's magazine. So I think it's a wash in terms of reload speed. And so the point goes to the PDP for a thinner grip. As far as aesthetics, both are hideous. They're both disgusting. And in fact, uh, so ugly that they hurt my feelings, both of them. As far as trigger pull is concerned, hard, stiff take up and a mushy ice cream break. And here, light, clean take up and a clean break that's a little mushier than the P99, but far cleaner than you could expect on a partially cocked striker. So the trigger is obviously way better on the PDP, but this is something that I promised we'd get into when we were looking at the lineage of these guns. When Walther kept that full cock striker, you'll notice there weren't as many adoptions by police for the PPQ. Now, this is not for rational or good reasons. Of course, we're talking about the police here. But the problem was, remember how on the Walther, if you had it, uh, on the P99, if you had it slightly out of battery and you pulled the trigger, you could just pull it double action. Well, watch here. It's not going to fire because the barrel is tilted down, but you have lost your strike and thus you will have to recock to get a second strike the glock being a partially cocked striker when you push it back pull the trigger it just goes dead until the slides in place and you can release the striker now you may be wondering why that would matter at all well the police apparently given the fact that they were obsessing over this have a tendency of shooting things while pressing up to them. 
or attempting to shoot things while pressing up to them. Of course, those of us who know how to use firearms know that it's not a good idea to try to fire your weapon out of battery because there is a point, even with a Glock, where you could fire it slightly out of battery uh, if you tried hard enough and got lucky enough. But this was enough for the, uh, you know, many of the, the purchasing bureaus to decide that these Walther guns were not acceptable for law enforcement. If you are somebody who routinely expects to you know, shoot at things while pressing into them. Stop it, man. Get some help. Still, there is an argument that such a thing could happen accidentally in a kerfuffle of sorts. And that one would... I guess... I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't make much sense to me because you can have all kinds of malfunctions and tap rack bang is the correct procedure. But the idea here and, and the reason people have used this as a knock against the Walters is that... With a Glock, you just pull the trigger again. With a Walther, it is another step. Gripped, uh, gripperation. Glocks are good with their little, little square duggies. But I'm a big fan of the diamond pattern. You've got more of them. Depth is about the same. More complex geometry. Slide release. Tremendous. Versus petite. For me, there's no comparison. I, I, I do have to recognize that there are some advantages to the Glock. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't outweigh the trigger pull you get out of the PDPF. Or the style points, because we all know there is one thing that is more important than anything else, and it's how cool you look carrying it. This may be ugly, but it has a certain cyberpunk aesthetic that is hard not to appreciate. And look, it's even got a little bringle on it. It's got a little, look, it's got a little digital dingus. What is it? Why they even did that? Look, got a little, that's a little Minecraft guy. <laughs> on the bottom shooting it at the range again super clean super crisp really easy to get follow-up shots with that incredibly short reset and crisp trigger uh, and again this is a gun i bought as a funny joke and then wound up having it be my main carry piece i really didn't expect that but there it was so of course this gun is marketed as the pdpf Right. I think that that was really foolish just because of how incredibly well this gun functions as a carry piece for anyone, man, woman, or that new type of stuff they got now. Super clean, super svelte, really thin, lots of firepower, excellent trigger. There's nothing about this that makes it uniquely feminine. I, I do think that Walther probably really nailed one market segment here. And that's when an older guy is in the gun shop. The guy behind the counter says, this one they made specifically for the girl. It says female on it. Uh, and then the old guy goes, oh, I'm gonna buy my wife that. They probably nailed that market with this. But I think this should have been something that was marketed like, um, like the Shield Easies. Those were expressly marketed for people who have reduced hand strength, uh, whatever. The elderly and they said elderly and ladies is what they kept saying for the shield easy. And they sell amazing. Tons of men buy them. And, and there's, they're marketed all over the place. You don't have to deal with any of that stigma. Whereas, of course, the gun community is, um, gets kind of weird about that. I mean, obviously, I'm a little different. I you know, carry one of these every day in a bright pink holster because I think it's funny. Uh, but I think that Walther should have pursued this in a more of like, you know, they could have called it like the super carry or, well, not, maybe not that word, uh, but they could have called it the everyone model. I don't know. Uh, literally anything but that. Cause I think there's a lot of guys out there. I think there's a lot of guys who would not buy a firearm that was marketed to women and a lot more of them than are females who will specifically look out for a gun that was marketed 
to them. All they had to do, call it whatever, call it the super conceal model or, you know, whatever, for Christ's sakes. It's all you had to do. In any event, it really takes the cake for me. It's the pairing with the T-Rex arm sidecar. It's a 30 round package that conceals incredibly. However, in terms of comparison between these two specific guns, there is one major point in the Glock's favor. And that's the price. I'm not 100% sure why, but the PDPF is a bit more than the regular PDP. As far as distributor price is concerned, your dealer is going to be paying about $75 more for the PDPF than they would a Glock 19 Gen 5. And as far as street price goes, I'm seeing the PDP selling for $100 more for a standard model, up to $200 for the colored models that they did eventually come out. And yes, pink is an option, but it is a bit more money. That said, for that extra money, you get a optics cut with multiple different plates out of the box, adjustable sights, which were probably more of a thing for import reasons. And a nice advantage of the PDP is that it does take a regular Glock footprint sight. So you can put on whatever Trijicons or whatever bullshit you like. But again, that is a point in the Glock's favor to be sure. So at the end of the day, what would I choose when it comes between a gun that was designed for a woman and a great carry gun? I go with this one. I would. I don't usually carry with optics. I have an astigmatism. There's some that will work. So the optics plate isn't a big draw for me. In fact, if there was an option for this without the optics plate, I would have bought that just because I like the cleaner look. I j am a total trigger queen. And the trigger on this is just so great for a carry gun. I am able to engage out at range. Once I've gotten to uh, gotten used to this gun a little bit more over the years, I was hitting an eight inch steel plate at 50 yards. No problem. Right off the cuff. It's just a great reliable, consistent gun um, that is held up to being carried and me falling on it and, you know, all of the other crap that happens with, you know, being stupid. But, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I think. I think it's a good gun because it's cool. This one looks good, and in my opinion, it shoots more good. And that's what matters in terms of a gun, is you want it to be a good one. And it's my favorite because I like it the most, actually. Have a good one, okay?